Today we're very fortunate to have our colleague, Gabe Scheibe, uh, who's a professor over at the downtown campus in the Edson uh, College of Nursing, School of Nursing? College of Nursing and Health Innovation. College of Nursing and Health, of course, Innovation. It's probably on your phone. It's on my phone right there. I know. It's on your CV. So, yeah? Turn on your mic. Oh, we can't hear his witty banter unless the mic's on. On, check, good. <clears throat> cool, all right, great. Um, Gabe joins us after spending a lot of time in Southern California where he did his undergraduate and his PhD. PhD was at USC and then you moved over to, here to ASU um, in 2006-ish. Mm -hmm. Ish. Uh, where he was a postdoc and early career researcher and then rapidly rose through the ranks um, in the, at the downtown campus where he now is a full professor and the director of the... Center for Health Promotion and Disease Prevention. Thank you very much, that's great. Um, and Gabe does a lot of fantastic work on health disparities, um, particularly in uh, youth communities and Latino youth communities, trying to understand how we uh, un understand, you know, the progression of type 2 diabetes, uh, what leads to higher incidences of type 2 diabetes, and how we can implement effective treatments for type 2 diabetes in these communities. Has a lot of funding from the National Institutes of Health to uh, work on these projects, and you're going to tell us a little bit about that today. So. Everyone, welcome, uh, Dr. Scheibe. Well, thanks for the opportunity, Noah, Ken. Really appreciate that you guys would uh, invite a chump like me to come and talk to a distinguished group like you all. But uh, I'll do my best to keep you entertained for about 45 minutes or so. Ben's going to keep me on track. I um, want to talk a little bit about our work and really thinking about our work in a comprehensive fashion. So there's gonna be some data, I promise there's some data slides, but there's also gonna be a lot of stories because anytime you work in a village, as you guys know, um, you hear a lot of those stories. And so those stories are what have emerged to help us think about where we go. Um, and this village, you will also be introduced to a lot of the people in the village. Now, um, you know, th this village includes people, but not including the village people. However, we do have YMCA collaborators. So one of our uh, organizations that work closely with the YMCA, so you'll, learn that there are people in the village who are at the YMCA. Uh, we will talk a little bit about health disparities, um, and I want to just kind of get some leveling here, and so I don't want to be presumptuous, but you don't have to answer this question, but thinking about your definition of health disparities or how you define health disparities in your work. Uh, there's lots of different definitions, and there's lots of new and emerging terms like health equity, health disparities, health equality, and all of those things have really important connotations for the work um, that goes on in those spaces, in those fields. And so just think about how you define health disparities, and then I'll give you um, what the National Institutes of Minority Health and Health Disparities defines as health disparities, which again is emerging and evolving over time as the science is emerging and evolving. You be good on online? Good, okay. So um, NIH will, NIMHD will say a health difference that adversely affects disadvantaged populations based on one or more of the following, and I'm not going to go through each of these, but it's a pretty standard definition of health disparities, right? Some differences in populations of diseases, and there's probably no definitive reason in this definition why there are these differences. It's just that these differences exist. And early on in my training, that's exactly how I approached health disparities, and this is kind of as a PhD student, and got slapped around quite a bit as I came to ASU and really worked with an organization called the Southwest Interdisciplinary Research Center, which is an NIMHD-funded um, health disparities center on campus, um, really thinking about health disparities from a research perspective and the terminology of, yes, there are these differences, but why are there these differences? And probably more importantly, what can we collectively do to change from this disparity mindset to either an inequity or an equality mindset? Um, I won't get too deep into that. But I'll tell you uh, that we do, talk, we do talk about disparities, we do talk about differences in type two diabetes rates. And so these are a couple of slides that I wanna just present um, just to kind of give you all an understanding of the majority of the work in disparities is differences. And so these are data uh, that were published last year looking at the prevalence and incidence rates of type two diabetes in children. And you'll see here that this is a non-Hispanic white population. And this is estimated prevalence of type two diabetes per 1,000 youth. So a couple of things to take away. This is still a very, very, very rare condition in the pediatric setting. Um, but what you can also take away is there's population level differences and potentially even some sex differences it, within populations. The other thing to take away is these are prevalence rates over the last you know, 16, 15, 16 years or so. 
and that the prevalence rates haven't really changed in certain groups. And in other groups, you see as this is in 2001 to 2007, the prevalence rates have increased. Again, this is prevalence. We look over here to incidence rates, and this was also released uh, last year, in, and from the same group using different data sets, um, that you will see that here is the cumulative sum of the incidence of diabetes over a similar time period, type 2 diabetes in youth. Um, and this is incidence per 100,000 person years. I'm not an epidemiologist, so please don't ask me any questions on that. Um, but what you see here is that the incidence, much like the prevalence, hasn't really changed in non-Hispanic white youth. But in every other uh, racial ethnic minority group, we see an increase in the incidence of type 2 diabetes over time. So this clearly fits the NIMHD or NIH definition of health disparities, and probably more importantly, some trajectory involved, right? That these, what's happening to these disparities? They're getting wider, right? So not only are there differences, but if I was a math major, I would say something about the differences in differences is actually getting greater. Right? Populations that are disproportionately affected by type 2 diabetes are now even more disproportionately impacted. So the other thing I'm going to do um, is I'm going to break some of this talk up because hearing me talk for 45 minutes is really boring. So I'm going to um, give you some interesting quotes from some philosophers that I really enjoy. Um, anyone here watch Ted Lasso? All right. I just got introduced to Ted Lasso and I can't stop watching it. Um, but taking on a challenge is a lot like riding a horse, isn't it? If you're comfortable while you're doing it, you're probably not doing, or you're probably doing it wrong. I was approaching health disparities early on in my career very much in the wrong sense. It's, hey, let's just look at these differences and try and understand these differences. Well, why do you try and understand differences? So that you can do something about those differences. But there's a lot of people who are still trying to understand these differences while those differences are getting more and more Greater? Not a grammar major either, obviously. Um, and so when I came to ASU, um, was really uh, lucky and fortunate to be teamed up with Felipe Castro, who's, uh, who's been at ASU for a long time, um, is a health psychologist, and really understands and looks at health disparities from a cultural lens. And he uh, presented a cultural, uh, sorry, conceptual framework for understanding differences in populations that reaches across multiple, multiple ecological levels. And I think a lot of the health disparities work early on was really at the individual level, and probably a lot of the work was based upon the individual behaviors and the biology. Um, and he you know, presented this conceptual model to say, when we think about health disparities, particularly if we think about doing something about it, we've got to reach across more than just one level of the ecological model, um, and particularly in kids, right? So we can talk about kids, and we can talk about their behaviors, and we can talk about their biology. And even early on in life, there's probably not a whole lot that they're going to do about that discussion, right? Great. Eat more. Why? Or, eat, you know, what, what am I eating? I don't know. Like, I just eat what's there, or I eat what I like. What should I do? Well, I'm only doing what I'm given the environment to do it in. And so in my biology, you know, I blame my mom and my dad for my biology. Well, OK, well, point well taken. But these are the upstream factors that I think we have tried to address or at least conceptualize and incorporate in some of our work. Um, so I'll, I'll spend a little bit of time talking about impact because we look at research impact in a little bit of a different way. And I'm hoping this is where we can have some discussion, particularly in this group. I really appreciate what the center here is trying to do. I really appreciate what the center is doing, has done, and where it's going. And, and I think that um, I told Ken earlier that I was talking to a buddy of mine who's a physician. And he says, Center for Evolutionary Medicine, they study the evolution of medicine? I said, no, they don't. I mean, it's an interesting concept, but that's not what they study. And I, I really do appreciate that. But if we go to uh, this Nature publication that was about 10 years now, 10 years ago now, that said, you know, really talking about how we understand and measure the impact of our work is becoming more and more challenging. So how do we measure the impact of the work that we do, either individually or collectively? And think about that. You know, and let's talk about that at the end of the talk if we have time, because that's a really important thing. We're entrusted with this um, really amazing opportunity that the government gives us money, our money. I mean, we gave it to the government, so they give it back to us. Thanks, government. Appreciate that. Um, but what do we do with that? And what is the onus for us to make sure that, that there's a return on that investment? And so in our group, we kind of define um, research impact in four ways. Obviously, scientifically, we advance the science. Um, but we also think about community engagement. Like, What does that mean? What does advancing the science while we engage with the community mean? 
We think about developing the next generation of scientists, so mentoring the next generation. Um, and then lastly, we also think about, and this is the, the most difficult thing, at least that I've been able to wrap my head around, and hopefully we have some collective wisdom here, is what does it mean to inform the public and the policy makers about the work that we're doing so that we have an advancement in that outer layer of that ecological model, right? That big systemic layer that we're hoping to change in order to address these disparities. So we're gonna go through this. I'm gonna sprinkle this in back and forth. Please stop me if you have questions, if you disagree, if you wanna push back, um, go for it. Uh, and I think somebody might be monitoring what's happening online. Yeah, okay, great. So I'm gonna introduce you to a couple of the, the folks in our village um, that I was fortunate enough to, to work with early on when I got here is the, the, the Family Wellness, the, Center, the Ivy Center for Family Wellness um, and Yolanda Kanopkin, who was a uh, dietitian and certified diabetes educator who was working at a free clinic that served the uninsured and the working poor and particularly Latino families. Um, and they have developed a program over time that was really addressing diabetes for those folks who didn't have care. And then from that came this opportunity to say, well, what about the next generation, right? The parents were saying, hey, it might be too late for us, right? Yeah, we can take medications, but we already have diabetes. What about our kids? And so um, when I uh, first engaged with Yolanda and her team, it was like, wow, she was talking to me about the American Diabetes Association, and this is you know, 10, 15 years ago, the evidence-based guidelines for screening and where to, where to find the highest risk kids. And beyond that, this is when the, the, the diabetes prevention program was just getting ramped up. Um, and she was talking about the science. And I'm like, wow, this community person is talking to me about evidence-based care. And then more importantly, evidence-based prevention strategies that weren't even available to kids, yet she was doing it in a, in a cl free clinic that was serving the working poor. And so it was this really um, interesting opportunity for me as a, as a researcher who thought he knew everything to say, I don't know what the hell I'm doing. Um, and these people in the community who are really addressing the local needs are way ahead of the curve. Now, there was no evidence in terms of whether they were, what they were doing was quote unquote working. She believed there was evidence. And so I said, well, this is a great opportunity. Let me kind of, I know how to, you know, I know how to do T-tests. I can run some stats, show me your data, right? And so this was the beginning of a really um, fruitful partnership. Um, and then you'll see in this slide here, and I, I'll bring some of this stuff back as we talk through the uh, presentation. Um, her emphasis was, listen, um, I've been doing this for a long time and it's time to pass the baton. And really, I wanna take those individuals who are invested in the community, who come from the community, who are committed to the community, and I don't care what their undergraduate major is, they're gonna become health promotion and practitioners. And most of them ended up going into uh, dietetics and nutrition sciences and nutrition practice. Um, I think of these four, and I might get this wrong, uh, dietitian, 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 maybe dietitian, physician's assistant, and just a handsome gentleman. I can't remember exactly what he's doing now. Um, but none of these were nutrition undergraduate majors. They all went to the clinic because they were volunteer translators. And they, they caught the bug from Yolanda of like, hey, we can actually do some stuff in the community. And again, I was just fortunate enough to be at the right place at the right time to connect with a really amazing group. And so um, over the past you know, 12 years or so, 15 years ago, so we, kind of have this timeline of the work that we've done, and it started with a clinical demonstration project. Essentially said, let's look at your data. Let's get in there and see what you've been able to do. In a retrospective chart review, and I say, hey, we all have to be on the IRB, and Yolanda's like, oh, be on the IRB, and everybody here understands what that means, right? What does it mean to be on IRB? What do we hate doing? Well, what do we hate doing? This is being recorded. Isn't it? Um, we all understand that there's a program that we have to sit in front of for about 20 to 40 hours the first time around to talk about how to do research, the CITI Human Subjects Training Program, right? So in order for our community partners to get on the IRB protocol, they all have to complete the Human Subjects Training Program. And they're like, you want me to sit in front of my computer for four hours, uh, four hours, for 40 hours to learn how to do this? And, and it was kind of like, yeah, kind of. Um, but that was really an important and eye-opening for us. Like, hey, yeah, if you want to partner with communities, there's got to be some give and take. And you know, they want to be on the, they want to kind of turn their data into something meaningful. Um, and so do we. This is how we work this collaboration. Um, and so, and we've kind of evolved that. We've actually worked with the IRB to say, listen, if we have community partners, let's come up with something that's they don't have to do 
good clinical practice guidelines. That doesn't make any sense for our community partners to do you know, GCP. We have to do it, which I understand, but let's come up with an innovative strategy that we can partner with communities in order to advance the science while also doing this in a meaningful way and a rigorous way that protects human subjects. They're not dealing with data per se, they're delivering the intervention in the community. Anyways, I'll get off that soapbox um, and hopefully we can talk more about it. But we, uh, where am I? Here we go. A clinical demonstration spot was basically a retrospective chart review, which turned into a, a pilot study that was actually funded by, by CERC through NIMHD. Um, that turned into a randomized control trial in Latino youth uh, with obesity. Um, that generated some ideas that we'll talk about. And I'm actually gonna um, kind of fast forward a little bit and only talk about three of these projects. Um, if we can touch upon this last one, which is a really interesting demonstration program, it's not a research project. We're actually, uh, in our, one of our community partners is actually the lead, in, uh, lead institution on this. Um, but I'm gonna walk you through a couple of these projects just to help you kind of get the, the vibe of what we've been doing over the past 10 years um, through our NIH uh, funded studies. So I'll start with um, a study that we just, uh, actually just published earlier this week, um, and I'll, I'll share with you the data. But this was our third randomized control trial. Um, and the, the study was to uh, test the efficacy of a culturally grounded community-based lifestyle intervention as compared to usual care control in 120 obese Latino adolescents with prediabetes. So this was an emergence from a randomized control trial that we did previously that didn't focus on prediabetes, it just focused on Latino youth who were obese. But what we decided in that previous trial, that if we found a kid who had prediabetes, we wouldn't randomize them to the control group, right? Ethically, it wouldn't be appropriate for us to randomize a kid with true prediabetes to a control group. And we figured, hey, we're recruiting from community practices um, and community programs and going out to health fairs and word of mouth. We wouldn't have that many kids with prediabetes. Uh, lo and behold, we had about 15% of kids with actual true prediabetes. And so because we recruit from the community within the community, and particularly some of the pediatric practices, we told them early on, hey, we're not going to randomize your kids with prediabetes into the control group. We'll automatically place them into the intervention group. Um, and that was a win-win, right? It was a win for the community. It was a win for the kids. They're being provided resources. Um, it wasn't a win for the science, uh, and we can talk a little bit about that, right? Because now we have this 15% of the population, and if you guys know power, power you know, calculations, that really does start to dig into your power from an efficacy perspective, efficacy perspective. But also importantly, what do you do with this one group that there's no comparison to? Um, and so we actually said, well, this is the opportunity. We will then create a randomized control trial um, that would look only at kids with prediabetes. But in order to do this, we had to come up with a uh, kind of a just usual care control, control group. So that was kind of an expansion of some previous work. So I just wanted to kind of tell you that story so I could tell you this one. Um, so we are now uh, in the field, we were in the field with this trial, and I'll tell you that this lifestyle intervention was developed by the community to be delivered in the community for the community, right? This is not something that I developed. It's something that our community partners developed, and it include nutrition education, uh, and uh, it delivered two families 60 minutes per week at, at the YMCA. Um, it addressed all of these aspects that you see here, better part of diabetes prevention, really understanding lifestyle, and this is where kids and families would come together in class, um, but also learn behavioral skills training, like SMART goals, setting SMART goals, achieving those SMART goals, monitoring what your behaviors are, monitoring yourself. Um, it's also really importantly included emotional health because what we've seen is that um, obesity in, in kids is associated with adverse uh, emotional and psychosocial health. So there was this, you know, doing a diabetes prevention program, but you can't forget that emotional health is a strong component of diabetes. Um, and the kids uh, would exercise three days per week. Um, and this was, you know, delivered in a meaningful way. Really not the highest intensity exercise, but we worked up towards uh, a, a, a dose that would allow for improvements in cardiometabolic risk factors because our, I'll tell you what our outcomes were in a second. Um, but I think the unique part of this program is it's uh, delivered, where am I? Okay, uh, de delivered uh, with key cultural constructs, right? Really talking about the family, family, the family roles and responsibilities. In other words, hey mom, it might be your role and your responsibility to provide a healthy meal for your family. And kids, it's your role to eat that meal. Not to say, mom, I don't like this, make me something else. Mom, I don't want that, make me something else. And so these conversations happen. Um, another piece that's really important in this is, you know, hey kid, it's your role and responsibility to tell your mom when you're full. And mom, it's your role and responsibility to hear that message. 
not to say, oh, you don't like my, my food? No, mom, I'm full. And so that's an interesting conversation that doesn't happen. Another, another important piece here is we start with the health risks of obesity. We, this is not a weight management program. This is not an obesity program by any means. It's a diabetes prevention program where these kids actually come in and get tested for diabetes. And we use the results of their diabetes test to start talking about that conversation of what is diabetes. Obesity is not, um, from an awareness perspective in this community, it's not necessarily thought of as a health condition, but diabetes is. So when you start talking about obesity, you may lose the community because, eh, you know, it's not that big of a deal. You talk about diabetes, it's a different conversation because all these families have strong family history of diabetes. They have mom, grandma, dad, amputations, some of the complications. So that's a different message. Um, and so we use this message as a, as, a, as a link or a leverage point for that conversation around health, not just around weight. Um, and some of these other cultural constructs that really have been developed over time by our community partners, really thinking about those personal interactions. These, these families come in, they get to know each other, the families get to work together, but they also get to know their health educators who oftentimes come from the similar or same communities as these families come from. So what's usual care? Uh, usual care, so I told you we couldn't do a, a true control group, and so um, we modeled usual care after what is happening at Phoenix Children's Hospital. So they have a, a weight management clinic. It's called the Care, uh, the care Clinic, which stands for Cardiometabolic Assessment, Research, and Education. And it's where a lot of kids get referred to from their pediatricians if they have weight-related comorbidities. And so we basically modeled usual care after PCH. And so this is my partner in crime, Mike Olson, who's the medical director for the care and the type 2 programs there, and he was the project pediatrician. So he would see these kids and mirror what he was doing at PCH at ASU. Um, and this is Elvia, who was one of the original dietitians, and actually um, Elvia was uh, traded for Laura because Elvia got promoted. I can't remember exactly how it worked. But, um, and this is Haniel Pimentel, who was a, a PCH fellow at the time. And so she was very interested in this. I'll talk about Haniel in a little bit. But essentially, now we went to pediatricians and said, hey, we have a new trial. It's focusing on kids with prediabetes. And they're either going to get this culturally grounded intensive lifestyle program delivered in the community, or they're gonna to get to go see a pediatric endocrinologist. So out of context, uh, in context, uh, the care clinic has about a six month waiting list. And so when you go to the pediatricians and say, we have this opportunity that they're gonna get this or that, and both of those things are better than what they're getting at the general pediatric provider uh, level. And so it's a win-win for the community again, right? So we're designing this program to actually be able to fit with that community context and not create further, exacerbate further health disparities that we know exist in the community. All right, I'll keep going. How am I doing, Ben, on time? OK. Um, our outcomes, we always use uh, a biological outcome and a psychosocial outcome. We always pair those two things together because um, I think it's important to think about diabetes as not just one or the other. It's kind of a combination of a lot of things. But for us, those outcomes resonate. And so uh, we use an insulin sensitivity glucose tolerance test where kids come in. They take blood samples. They drink a, a sugar drink, 75 grams of glucose in solution. We take blood for this uh, study every 30 minutes, and we can measure insulin and glucose concentrations over two hours and get, a, like a, get, a, get an estimate of insulin action, insulin secretion, and how well the beta cell is doing. Um, we can talk about that later on the, the Q&A part if we want to, but really a, an important physiologic outcome as it looks at risk for diabetes. And then we also do use a, a weight-specific quality of life instrument. And this instrument was developed by our partners in Seattle Quality of Life Group that was really from the voices of kids with obesity. So they generated these questions to resonate with these communities in a meaningful way. Not experts who think this is what teenagers are worried about their weight. This is what teenagers say about their weight. And so really using these metrics and these measures from a physiologic perspective that are physiologically relevant and proximal to type 2 diabetes, so not obesity, in other words, um, and a patient-reported outcome, if you will, that's meaningful to that patient. But in this trial, we also were really interested in how come diabetes risk changes, independent of weight. We know these kids aren't going to lose weight because we're not focusing on weight. Um, and so we went back to our partners at Phoenix Children's, um, and this is Samita Bailey, who's a radiologist, and Harry Hu, who's an a MRI physicist. And we used uh, DEXA for body composition. But more importantly, we were looking at organ fat, specifically liver and pancreatic fat. And I'll talk a little bit about that um, in a couple of, well, I'll actually talk about that in the next slide. So in addition to really delivering this intervention in the community, by the community, for the community, we wanted some sophisticated measures of biology and physiology. 
Um, and there's a reason for that, and hopefully we'll talk a little bit more about that. And Haniel, she was a fellow at the time, was interested in liver fat in kids, in particular liver fat in Latino kids. Liv uh, Latino kids have the highest prevalence of non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, um, and we think that's a precursor for type 2 diabetes. And so uh, we were able to um, co-opt the magnet at PCH, so the kids would leave ASU at the Clinical Research Center downtown, they'd go to PCH, um, usually on a weekend, uh, the technicians would roll the kids in to the magnet, and they would get a measure of hepatic fat and a measure of pancreatic fat. So these measures of organ fat are really thought to be some of the drivers of type 2 diabetes uh, in kids and even in adults. But, um, and, and I think the important part here is, you know, this was an area of interest for Haniel as a developing fellow, as a pediatric endocrinologist. Um, and so what we did with this project, and this is, a, this is a baseline correlations, we showed that you know, total fat was associated with visceral fat, so like the fat around these organs, as well as uh, the fat in these organs, hepatic fat and pancreatic fat. But you'll see here that visceral fat is the one that's, um, and people may have heard this term, the, the central adiposity, visceral fat is, seems to be more highly correlated with pancreatic fat and hepatic fat. And once you figure out where the fat is stored, potentially we start to think of where are those targets for intervention, right, from a biological, physiological perspective. Um, and this is all baseline data uh, that Haniel published earlier this year. Um, and what we found is after controlling for age and sex, the only fat depots that were related to glycemia were hepatic fat and pancreatic fat. So total fat wasn't associated with these measures of hyperglycemia, waist circumference wasn't, and visceral fat. But the organ fat was significantly associated with fasting glucose, and only hepatic fat was uh, associated with two-hour postprandial glucose. So we're starting to get at physiology, right? Fat in the pancreas might be the driver of fasting hyperglycemia. Fat in the liver seems to be a driver of not only fasting as well as postprandial hyperglycemia, independent of these other measures of fat. All right. This other really interesting part, and this is Kylie Vanderweis, Vanderweis she was a fellow with us, is what do we do when you put kids in a magnet? You start to see things and you start to see things that you weren't actually looking for. So what do we do when we see things, a kid comes in for a diabetes study, you put them in a magnet, and you see, uh-oh, you've got something called horseshoe kidney. What are we supposed to do? Well, kind of, kind of want to let that kid know. But what does that kid know about horseshoe kidney? Not a whole lot. What does that kid's parents know about horseshoe kidney? Not a whole lot. What does that kid's pediatrician know about horseshoe kidney? Also probably not a whole lot. And probably most importantly, does having horseshoe kidney on an MRI when you don't have any symptoms even matter? We have no idea. And so uh, in collaboration with uh, the Children's Hospital IRB, we came up with what we thought was the best available um, approach to how to communicate incidental findings that were reportable, gotcha, thanks, man, um, that were report reportable in this population, right? These are not kids who are coming directly from a pediatrician to the MRI magnet from a, for a problem. These are kids who may have went to a health fair, were concerned about diabetes, got into a study to prevent diabetes, and now we find something on an MRI that in theory should be returnable. And so um, this is kind of the beauty of this collaboration. So the IRB helped work with us and said, well, we need all these images to be read, and if there's something big and scary, that needs to be known like early on. And so the technologist would alert the radiologist, the radiologist would review, the radiologist would pick up the phone and talk to the uh, Michael Olson, the, the, the phys project physician. The project physician, then the onus is on them to say, okay, is this something that we should return? I'm not quite sure. I'm gonna pick up the phone and talk to one of my colleagues at PCH, one of the subspecialists and say, hey, is horseshoe, horseshoe kidney something that we should return and be worried about? And if the answer to that is yes, then Micah would go back, talk to the family, talk to the, talk to the kid, talk to the family, and then talk to a referring pediatrician or a pediatrician if this kid had a pediatrician. Um, and we're working in a population that not all these kids had a PCP. Um, and so we had 139 images, both baseline and follow-up. 25 were deemed clinically actionable. 18 of those kids had a PCP. Only about seven of them scheduled a follow-up. We're not quite sure why, but only seven of them did. Um, seven of those kids who had um, clinically actionable findings uh, were referred to a safety net clinic. Back, actually, back to our partners at St. Vincent de Paul because they have a medical tr clinic that treats um, uninsured and low-income populations. And so it's kind of, you get the, the picture of this village. If we're starting to do this, all right, so now we have these kids being referred to PCH. We have the village in PCH. We have the communication happening. And then importantly, we're trying as best as we possibly can 
at ASU, right, we're not a medical center, to try and close the loop. Um, and this is done through this you know, series of collaborations uh, in a way that I only want to bring this up because that's kind of the village it's going to take so that we don't do what? Exacerbate health disparities. That's the whole idea here is, is we don't want research and technology that's being developed to exacerbate or make worth health, work, worse health disparities that are already known that are existing. And so that's kind of why we spend a lot of time and maybe why I've spent too much time talking about this slide, but um, just to give you kind of a flavor of how we think about health disparities differently. So I told you, I, I showed you some data. This was just published actually in JAMA Open earlier this year, or earlier this year, earlier this week. Armando Pena, who was a PhD student in our lab, is now doing a postdoc in School of Public Health in Indiana, uh, is a leader author on this, um, that really looked at what are these primary outcomes. So what you see here is, uh, this is the intervention group. I remember we talked about the intervention so long ago, like way before the MRI, and way, like I just went on a tangent. Um, this is the intervention group, and this is the usual care control group. And you see there's a significant decrease in two-hour glucose, a measure of hyperglycemia after they drink the drink. Um, but both groups ended up decreasing. And when you look at the delta, we see that there's no significant difference between these two groups. So that's a pretty interesting finding. Well, we followed these kids up for six more months, so then they saw uh, Dr. Olson again here, those kids who were in the intervention, the intervention, uh, they had some booster sessions, and then uh, they were kind of released to what we call free range, um, or maybe I call it free range, nobody else does. Um, and you see that the two-hour glucose continues to decrease over time. Um, over time, this is about a 15% milligram per deciliter difference. So if you look at baseline, the, the definition of uh, impaired glucose tolerance for prediabetes is 140. And you see uh, that after the intervention, this 15 milligram difference was significant from baseline, but not significantly different between these two groups. And this is our quality of life data, and you see significant improvements in quality of life in the intervention group, but not in the control group. And so this is kind of an interesting take home message, right? Because in the usual care group, they talk about diabetes, but they don't have the emotional component to that, uh, that discussion, whereas in the intervention group, they did. And so we see significant reductions in type 2 diabetes risk factors and improvements in quality of life in the intervention and not the control group. So this is kind of that conversation that we're having, like, all right, what does this mean? Well, both groups got better. That's kind of our message. Um, and so now what we're interested in is, well, let's look at the cost and the cost effectiveness of these two treatments, right? These two prevention strategies. One delivered in the community, one delivered, although it wasn't in a medical setting, it mirrored what's happening in the medical setting. So Mike is actually working on the data to look at cost and cost effectiveness because we're trying to get to that outer layer of policy. Uh, what else did we learn? We actually did some qualitative interviews and I am not a qualitative researcher, so, um, I apologize in advance, but we talked to one of the dads uh, whose family did really well, and what he quoted is, the program worked better for participants, he didn't call them participants, um, that always had the support of their mom and dad. We uh, talked to one of our referring pediatricians, and he said, I really only think that when the whole family is invested in this, whether it's the mom or the dad, that going as a family and how that's something that now they are doing together, that really changed their outlook on things, and then they carry that on to relatives and other family members. We talked to the CEO of one of our collaborating institutions who said, I believe that partnerships make organizations stronger. I think there's more work to be done than any one organization can accomplish on its own. And then we talked to a state senator uh, who basically said, I mean, working with local governments, you really need to have the alphabet of coalitions. So you literally have to have a coalition that is circling legislators and providing them with information, and then it begins to make sense. And then they'll ask, why haven't we been doing this all along? So kind of trying to understand beyond the data what is driving some of these bigger questions. Um, so I'll do a pause here to one of my other favorite TV philosophers who said it's going to be curious about many things. It's good to be curious about many things. So we stay curious, as the Dos Equis guy will say. Stay, stay curious, my friends. So I'll talk to you a little bit about a, another project that kind of it was happening in parallel with that project. We're looking at prediabetes in adolescents, and our community partners were like, you're waiting kind of a long time to start intervening if you're talking about prevention for these kids, right? Your adolescents and prediabetes. And they said, we need to work earlier in the life course. And so we developed a, what's called an integrated research practice partnership. Um, and with this, this was a program. It was a research project, but there's no control group. We were trying to say, could we de develop something across institutions, across collaborating institutions to come together to address this in young kids? And if we're working in young kids, we obviously had to work more closely with families. I won't get into the details. I'll just show some fun pictures. Um, and so we delivered this in collaboration with a federally qualified health center in Maryville. 
Um, and actually, Maryville is a village of the greater Phoenix area uh, at the YMCA in Maryville um, for kids and their parents. Uh, this, is, this is Monica Diaz, who I showed you early on, is now a dietitian. She's actually also just awarded an NIH um, uh, supplement, and she's a master student. So our, our goal is to get her from a master student onto a PhD in population health, um, really kind of building that capacity within the community. Uh, you see kids trying new foods, probably some form of quinoa. Uh, parents exercising together, parents learning with kids, right? A really unique model. Um, and I want to share one other thing. So we, we do have some data from this. It, again, this was published a couple years ago by a postdoc uh, in our group, Erica Soltero, who's now a junior faculty at Baylor College of Medicine, and Jenny Mendez, who was a community partner of ours. Um, and what we looked at in this group was, you know, just body fat. You know, what happens to these kids and these parents? Not a randomized control trial. We weren't trying to test the efficacy of the intervention. We're trying to test the ability of partners to come together to address health needs and linking a community cl clinic, an FQHC or Federal Public Health Center, with a uh, community agency, the YMCA, to send their kids over to the YMCA to get this intervention delivered. Um, we had at the end of this uh, a big 60-person uh, Zumba match that was actually led by our program officer from the state. So he was at the Arizona Department of Health Services, Omar Contreras, who actually was a doctor of public health student. So he did his doctor of public health um, with us and was actually one of the program officers involved and actually is a wonderful Zumba instructor as well. The kids led, uh, the, the, kids led the stretching sessions and the, the families brought together uh, the healthy meal at the end. So if you can see here, it says YMCA. Um, so really kind of understanding this family notion and generating these ideas. And I know I'm running out of time, guys, so I'll actually skip this. Um, so last, uh, last philosopher, Matthew McConaughey, and for those who are younger, uh, this is from one of his uh, early movies, Dazed and Confused, I believe. Uh, Life is a series of commas, not periods. He was very prophetic even at the time. Um, and so this is our new trial. That was actually a renewal of our previous R01, and it's a family diabetes prevention program, and this will test the efficacy of a family-focused, culturally grounded intervention. And for this, we're actually focusing on the entire family. And so what you see here is, how do you develop family interventions? Well, this is uh, number one in innovation, and look at how this dad here has uh, been able to take the pictures, probably before selfie sticks, while still being in the family picture. And so we had to come up with a design that said, well, we want to include the entire family, right? Diabetes is a family or household issue. And so this design really focuses on including the entire household. So we actually go home, before we start the intervention, the health educators go into a home visit and we expect everybody in the family to be there. They get to know the entire family. And regardless of whether you came in for testing, everyone in the entire household is invited to become part of the intervention sessions. Bring anyone uncles, aunts, moms, dads, grandmas, grandpas, um, because that's really what it's going to take to address health in the entire household. Um, we also had to adapt a family diabetes prevention model. Believe it or not, there's no diabetes prevention models for entire families. And we thought the core of this model had to be a strengths-based model, um, looking at family resilience, empowerment, engagement, and cohesion, and building on these capacities that families inherently may have in order to improve health outcomes of diabetes risk and quality of life. Um, I don't have any data. We just started. We're in year. We just started year two of this trial. We're in the first couple of cohorts. So just want to kind of give you some thoughts about how we just keep learning along the road. But go back, going back to those quotes, and really what's important. Um, I think this is from a Nature publication several years ago when when they were kind of thinking about the CTSA and really closing the valley of death. As you guys can appreciate what this valley of death is, the translation spectrum, a translation gap. The 17 years, I think, is the term that's used between discoveries and applications in the community, um, or applications in population, that it takes 17 years on average for discoveries that are generated in the, in the lab to be translated into the real world. And really, only about 15% of those discoveries get translated. Um, and so in this grant, we actually have an implementation. And we're, it's, a, it's called a hybrid type 1 trial that we're testing efficacy while planning for implementation in the community. And so our implementation is to create a statewide stakeholder informed plan to take family diabetes prevention to scale. We're generating lap rapid learning communities with organizations that serve Latino families across the state, exploring the needs, readiness, costs of, and capacity for implementation across these agencies, and planning adaptations and activities uh, to enhance fit and function of the intervention with this or within these organizations. And we have no idea whether this is going to work. but. We have to plan as if this is going to work so that we can quickly translate it into the real world if it is successful. Um, and this is uh, kind of a, a schematic of 
in our Viva Maryville project that I showed you about, we said, all right, everybody you work with in diabetes prevention across the state, put them in. And the Arizona Diabetes Coalition um, actually has uh, joined us on this uh, partnership on the new grant. And they're the ones that are really helping us find these communities and these community agencies that are uh, likely going to be the ones, if this is successful, that can roll this out uh, at broad scale. Um, and probably another one of uh, old school guys that maybe Ken and I know. You guys know Yogi Berra? When you come to Fork in the Road, take it. So I'm, how much time do I have? We have a couple more minutes. Uh, I talked a little bit about dissemination, so that's dissemination science. Um, we're also talking about disseminating these findings back to the community, and we think that's an important. So we invite our kids who, and our kids and our families who are in our trials back to learn about what we found. And we have, um, this is from our previous trial, this is one of our first participants, uh, learning about kind of just getting caught up um, of what we did. And you know, we have our career panel, so these are all of the families who were in our previous trial. But we also have a career trial, and so I've already talked to you, introduced you to Armando Pena, who's now, like I said, a postdoc. This is Haniel Pimentel talking to families about you know, going into medicine and actually going in beyond medicine into uh, pediatric endocrinology. This is Estella Barasa, who was a master's student and was, the, was one of the original trainers for one of our projects, and she's now uh, the health, I'll get this wrong, I apologize, Estella, um, the health education coordinator for one of the school districts in, in downtown Phoenix. Um, this is Jessica, she was a research tech, she's now an ER doc um, in Indiana. This is Maria Silva, who was one of the health educator uh, promoters early on. She's now a dietitian. actually she now runs the care program, she's the care program manager at Phoenix Children's Hospital. And this is Allison Williams, who is our, my program manager for our entire program and keeps the world um, whole, round, and uh, going forward. So really giving this back in a meaningful way, right? This is not about here's, a, here's the publication that we had, here is what we found, but more importantly, here are the people involved that helped us generate this. Here, you want to become a scientist? Listen to Armando. You want to become a pediatric specialist, a community health educator, a healthcare administrator? These are folks who are telling their stories to these families in a meaningful way. Um, we also did some, uh, uh, some delivery to uh, the public policy. So we had a policy forum. Uh, we had Representative Heather Carter, uh, Maurice Lee, who was the founder and president of the Arizona Safety Net Clinic, Julia Hoffman, who was the chair of the Arizona Diabetes Coalition, and this chump over here, um, gave a, a community public policy, uh, um, almost a town hall, but talking about what this means, talking about diabetes prevention in the community um, and how it impacts different layers, right? From the clinic to the advocacy to the legislator legislation. We also partnered with the Morrison Institute and we put this out as a policy brief to try and hit some of the C-suite level folks who really um, are important as you see about those coalition of coalitions, right? Starting to talk about this work in a unified fashion. Um, why is it important to talk about policy? Well, and this is I think my last data slide. Um, we looked at, in collaboration with Connor Sheehan who's out of the uh, uh, family studies here, and Esther Gottlieb, who was a CERC data analyst, they looked at census data. So they generated census data for um, all of the tracks that the kids came from, from one of our earlier studies. So it was 100, 120 kids, we have about 90 tracks represented. 84.2% of those tracks were in areas of high concentrated disadvantage. And what we found is that after controlling for individual level factors, individual socioeconomic status of the kids and the families, individual level income, individual level education, um, we still see that housing stability is inversely associated with hyperglycemia. The more stable your house, the lower these kids, the, sorry, the more stable the house is in your census track, the lower your uh, two-hour glucose was. Uh, um, tr uh, stable transportation, those census tracks that had more um, less access to stable transportation had higher glycemia. So we're looking at census track information and individual level diabetes risk after controlling for individual level factors. Um, median rent, as rent goes up, two hour glucose goes down. And really this is kind of, the, this was the take home is in these census tracks, the, the closer you are, the more concentrated you have fast food restaurants, the higher your two hour glucose. So really, these are not factors that any of our kids are going to control, but also not factors as researchers that we're going to control. This is why policy level um, data are important. What we took these data to is we actually went to CERC's uh, Community Advisory Board, and we told them this was you know, kind of what we, what we found, and we wanted their information of what they thought about these data. 
Um, and so this is from our, this is actually from quotes from the paper that, that Connor published earlier this year. And, and Dulce is actually the, the Community Advisory Board Chair, um, helped us kind of gather these quotes. And we said, while, while our findings indicated that del deleterious aspects of neighborhood characteristics on diabetes risk, our CAB members noted that there may be strengths within neighborhoods that are not strengths, uh, and that these strengths can positively influence community health. We're missing those strengths, right? We're looking at this from a deficit perspective. What are those strengths? Well, they said neighborhoods are nuanced, and that relying on census tract level data to describe neighborhoods is limiting, because they talked to us about the community gardens. They talked to us about the energy and the enthusiasm that some of the, church are having, the churches have in their communities. But I'll ask you guys, how many of you know what census tract you live in? Exactly. Those census tract levels are really important for looking at these big pictures, but they're not nuanced enough to know what's happening in communities and in neighborhoods. And really, that's kind of the notion of the village, right? It can't just be this one big, we're all the same. All these kids came from, uh, not all, most of these kids came from concentrated disadvantaged neighborhoods. But there's still variability within those neighborhoods and driving diabetes risk. Um, and so I'll say, you know, none of this work happens in a vacuum. Um, our team was fortunate enough to win the 2019 President's Medal for Social Embeddedness, and there's um, uh, Mr. Innovation himself. Uh, and, and this, I, what I like about this is this is really about seven organizations who are represented in this, uh, in this um, award. And on that, I will give you some of those organizations and say that we say in our lab, teamwork makes the dream work. And really, this is a team of teams and a coalition of coalitions. And so I'll stop there and hopefully have some fun banter. Ben. So what's horseshoe liver? Hors <laughs> horseshoe kidney. Oh, kidney. Horseshoe kidney. Um, no idea. It's, a, it's an abnormality in a kidney that actually looks like a horseshoe. And it may, have an, it may have an impact on these kids or may not. But the pediatric nephrologist suggested this was something that was troubling enough to her that they wanted the kid worked up. So we got the kid back to the pediatrician, back to, I think, back to PCH to get worked up. Um, but I think it's a, a congenital abnormality that may or may not cause uh, trouble down the road. Other thoughts? Uh, so thank you. That was really awesome and uh, really cool work and also fairly, not to get too savvy, but like inspirational in terms of seeing research translated almost in real time to the communities that it affects. Um, so that said, I have a question. Yeah. I have a bunch of questions, but I'm just going to go with the simplest one. So in the beginning, the first data slide that you showed um, showed differences in type 2 diabetes in kids mm -hmm. and showed uh, differences in prevalence for uh, males and females. Mm -hmm. And then when you were doing the interventions, you kind of said controlling for sex and, uh, and didn't really go into whether or not there are any sex differences. And if so, would interventions culturally be different for boys and girls or, you know, however the gender identity plays out? Yeah, great, great question. And yeah, I, I appreciate the question. Um, actually, we have a postdoc uh, who's very interested in this, Morgan Braxton, who just joined us. Um, we actually did look at sex as a biological variable in our previous randomized control trial and showed that sex did moderate the effect of the intervention on some adiposity outcomes, whereby boys actually did better than girls um, in the intervention. And so we're just, as, as NIH is pushing this sex as a biological variable, um, we're just now trying to understand what that means, not only for response interventions, but probably more importantly, as you put it, do we need to design more precise or precision interventions to address sex as a biological variable? It's a really bad answer to a really important question that we have not figured it out as to what that would look like if we did roll it out. Thank you. Thank you. Cool. So I thought it was really interesting in your intervention study that you know they were equally efficacious, right? The two yeah. the two interventions, um, but there was a dramatic difference in the weight specific quality of life quality measures, of life, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, did that extend to other measures of quality of life? Like, are, are those, is that quality of life survey like restricted to questions about 
uh, body image and weight and things like that? It, it is. It's it's measures self, social, and environmental um, subdomains of quality of life. But it's all about weight. It's because of my weight, I'm embarrassed to exercise in front of my friends. Because of my weight, I don't eat in front of my friends. Because of my weight, I can't find clothes that fit me. So it's um, that is a weight specific quality of life. We did have a generic quality of life instrument um, that did not show any statistical significant differences over time or between groups. Um, and we think that the weight specific is really getting at what's important to those kids. Um, so, yeah. So, I mean, that's really interesting because then the, the question is, you know, while they are equally efficacious is one, is one stickier and have you know, longer lasting and the one where, where they're actually, you know, if it's questions about like, I, I can't exercise outside in front of my friends because I'm self-conscious about my weight. And if they are able to manage that and continue, you know, improve their quality of life in that sense, then I mean, how long are you, how, how, how far out have you followed yeah. these? Yeah, so um, these kids, so we stopped following, this is a one year follow up period. Um, we actually have another grant uh, through NIMHD that's bringing kids back from one of our previous trials five to seven years later. Um, and we don't measure quality of life because it doesn't really translate good to kids transitioning to young adulthood. Um, so we're looking at those data now, uh, and we do see two distinct profiles that emerge. Some kids maintain and actually do real well, and others kind of don't, um, and we're not quite sure why. Uh, so we're kind of trying to tease out why those kids who uh, you know, were in intervention five or six years ago as they become young adults, what else is going on so that we can kind of hammer back to those things that are important to those kids. Uh, we don't have any quality of life data, though, for that one. That's just uh, physiologic data. Ben? So about the uh, the fasting glucose tolerance test, yeah. uh, so that's like multiple blood draws, or do you put it in a catheter? Yeah, they'll, they'll have an IV. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Um, but do you have participants that you know join the study, but then when they realize how many blood draws it's going to be, that they pull out? Um, it, it, I'm not trying to think, and I won't have these data that's really accurate. So some some kids do for this for the for the study that I showed you data on. Um, those kids actually have to have a pre-OGTT to qualify, so they have to be pre-diabetic. And so by the second by the second time they come in, they kind of know what they're in for. Um, but we do have kids who, who don't want to do the blood draw, and those kids likely get screened out early on because we let them know that, you know, they're going to have a blood draw, and we put cream on it and try and numb it. But, um, you know, a lot of the kids, that doesn't really matter to them. Um, we have had a couple of adverse uh, responses, but mostly it's not to the needle per se, it's to the ingestion of the glucola because it's, it's really nasty. Um, it's sweet stuff, uh, which I was like, oh, it's just Fanta. And they're like, that's no, not like Fanta. Um, <laughs> question over there? Yeah, sorry, it's more a science question. Oh, science question? We've uh, got to leave that to somebody else. <laughs> I was, so we know that uh, type 2 diabetes is typically acquired with lifestyle, um, but is there some GWAS study or other genetic study showing some association, some susceptibility based on genetic? Absolutely. And so that uh, explain some, some pattern too? Yeah, that? so great question. So obviously it's a complex disease, right? It's an interaction of gene and environmental factors. Um, we are very interested in heterogeneity and response to intervention, um, and so we're, we're actually looking at that. Um, we just got a grant from NIH that is looking at the heterogeneity response to various interventions um, in terms of changes in liver fat, and looking, working, collaborating with TGen on this to look at if extracellular vesicles can differentiate those kids who do versus don't respond both to lifestyle intervention as well as bariatric surgery. So we have a couple of different arms. Um, and looking how change, variability and changes in the liver bat might be able to uh, be identified using uh, molecular markers. So yeah, it's a really interesting question. Not every kid responds, um, even though it's the same intervention. And so we don't really know why that is. And we look at heart rates. We look at everything that we can think of physiologically, and it doesn't really differentiate, even behaviorally. And so it's probably you know kind of in, in this group's uh, um, back to say there's probably some kids that genetically or genomically are adversely set up and you know either we need to work earlier preconception or in the womb to really kind of make an impact in some of those kids or they need a different type of intervention like lifestyle is not the appropriate intervention for them maybe it's more something more biologically oriented and th those program um, do they start when the mother or the family has a kid that is really young like how you know how what's a nutritive portion for a kid and because yeah. that could like I don't know how it worked those programs in, in Arizona but um, like our family followed since the kid is really 
sm like small? Yeah, so um, your, your point and your kind of comment is really important. Uh, I, I don't think it's too late for, for us, um, but the earlier we can intervene in the life course, and there's a lot of interest in our group as well as in other groups of what happens in utero particularly, mm -hmm. that in utero environment um, mm -hmm. might be the opportunity for us to really kind of focus in on. Uh, I don't think it's too late, um, but I mean, these kids are all already obese. Um, so they're gonna be obese for the rest of their life. So what happens if we get early on before they're, you know, before they are obese or before they hit, you know, kind of some of these other milestones? Um, probably more impactful, to be honest. Mm -hmm. thank yeah, thank you. Got two questions for you here online the, uh, from Angela Garcia. The first one is, have you considered working directly with payers for coverage of family-centric uh -huh. diabetes lifestyle programs? Thanks, Angela. Great question. So actually, Micah and I had a conversation with the medical director for United um, a couple of weeks ago, and we came to this epiphany. So the U.S. Preventative Task Force says uh, the minimum effective dose for lifestyle intervention for managing obesity is 26 hours. We're, you know, that's not being covered right now, so we can't get 26 hours. The most effective biological pharmaceutical treatments for managing obesity in kids are not covered uh, by insurance. And bariatric surgery is the most effective intervention for kids, is also not covered. So none of the effective evidence-based interventions are currently being covered by payers. And so that was our conversation to her is, we've got tools in the toolkit, but none of those tools are currently being covered. And you know, poor lady, she was representing her organization, but essentially she said, we gotta talk to Access. And so the folks at PCH and PCCN are helping us uh, schedule a meeting with the medical director from access to from the access plans to start talking about how to get this stuff covered. Then Angela had a second question, which I think relates to what Elise just asked you, which is, um, have you looked at differences in effectiveness of the intervention interventions based on life history windows? So like, is there a sensitive period when these are particularly effective or less effective? We have not. And it's actually one of the PhD students in our lab. That's what she's interested in her. Uh, and I won't steal her, completely steal her thunder, but Eukarya Wabiche is a, a second year PhD student who you've met. Um, and she's very much interested in kids exposed to gestational or kids exposed to hyperglycemia in utero, do they have different trajectories in response to the same intervention? Um, and she does have a hypothesis that she's working through. So she's using these data and gonna be able to hopefully answer that question because we have data on the moms now. Ken. Way cool talk, by the way. But, Thank uh, you, Ken. Uh, but I, I was struck by the, the, you're saying that the obesity is not as predictive as, or, or is not predictive as opposed to uh, liver fat mm -hmm. accumulations. When you look at your outcomes, have you stratified as to whether, in fact, it makes a difference whether you are showing liver fat or not? Um, it's, it's funny. Another postdoc, that's what she's looking at. So we have all these great students and we have all this data. We haven't looked at it yet. And she's um, actually going to look at whether changes in liver fat are associated with improvements in beta cell function during the intervention, because that's the hypothesis. Is we think as, as fat is being um, redistributed or decreased specifically in some of these organs, that may be the driving me physiologic mechanism by which lifestyle may work better for some versus other. None of these kids lost any weight. So because kids are growing, they don't lose weight. There was a, um, there was a significant effect of the intervention on body fat compared to the usual care control, but it wasn't major. We're not talking about huge changes in body fat. Um, but organ fat, that's the question, is what's happening in, inside the organs, which may be a little bit more responsive to uh, lifestyle intervention. So we'll see, um, but to be continued on that one. Talk. Yeah, really wonderful talk. Thank you. What's your name? Marina. Marina. I'm a graduate student in Noah's lab. Great. Um, so I noticed one of the um, kind of survey responses that you put up, someone had commented on essentially family structure. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering if you guys have been able to look at family characteristics, like number of siblings, essentially how supportive the stability of individual families. You know, you kind of got at that with the neighborhood level, but. Yeah. yeah. So and it's a great question, and it's actually one of the aims in our new R01. It's basically we're going back to the families with the understanding is how does family structure and function 
influence the ability to spread the information across the family. And so we're still working on the, the, the qualitative aspect of that, right? Well, we got to go back and interview these families to understand that. Um, we have the families, the numbers, and we can quantitatively look at that. But as you pointed out, it's probably way more nuanced, right? It's like, who is the driver of some of this stuff in the family? And I think we've got to rely on qualitative work in that. And um, I am not a qualitative expert. And so we're, we're kind of working through how best to do that. Do we just talk to the mom, just talk to the dad, just talk to the kids, talk to the entire family? So we're not quite sure, but you know, four years from now, we might have an answer to that really interesting question. You thank you. All right, guys, I think we're at time, Noah. Yeah, let's, let's uh, thank Gabe for a wonderful talk. And Thanks. hopefully we get to develop some more collaborations between our centers. Sounds good. Thanks, guys.